This program has received support through an unrestricted grant uh, from AstraZeneca. These are the steps that have been taken to mitigate potential bias for this program. Tonight, from the Lung Health Foundation, we would like to welcome Jennifer McKinnon. She's a respiratory therapist and certified respiratory educator at the Lung Health Foundation, where she has, for the past three years, been leading the work in the provider education and clinical service area. The Lung Health Foundation is a leading health charity dedicated to ending gaps in prevention, diagnosis, and care of lung disease in Canada. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our moderator tonight, uh, Dr. Anthony Derzo. Dr. Derzo is an associate professor at the University of Toronto, an utopian researcher at the Department of Family and Community Medicine at U of T, and director of the Primary Care Lung Clinic in Toronto. He has a very keen interest in promoting respiratory health in primary care, and I've had the opportunity to do so at the local, national, and international level over the 30 years. Thank you for being with us, Dr. Derzo. You may present our guest speaker tonight. Uh, thank you very much, Lisa, and uh, thanks to our colleagues at the Lung Health Foundation and, and AstraZeneca and uh, to Karen, uh, who is going to be our speaker tonight. Um, uh, Karen is a registered respiratory therapist and certified respiratory educator with more than 40 years of experience. Uh, she's a former COPD clinic coordinator at the Royal uh, Victoria Hospital uh, in Barrie. As well, she's a former primary care asthma program coordinator and asthma educator in the adult and pediatric asthma clinics uh, at the Royal Victoria Hospital. Uh, and she's currently a consulting respiratory educator with Best Care Asthma Research Group Incorporated in Windsor, Essex County. Uh, Karen, it's a real pleasure for us to welcome you tonight. We look forward uh, to your presentation. Well, thank you, everyone. Good evening. And I am really excited to be participating in this forum this evening. Uh, I have no conflicts of interest, and my only disclosure is that I am receiving an honoraria for tonight's uh, presentation. So we'll be putting up my objectives for this evening. You will see some overlap with some of Dr. Gerzo's presentation in part one. But tonight, I'll be speaking from uh, excuse me, uh, I'll be speaking from a slightly different perspective, uh, presenting similar um, information, but from an educator's perspective. Uh, I'll be introducing the importance of reducing exacerbations, which unfortunately are a significant component of the clinical course of COPD. And throughout the presentation, my goal is to demonstrate the value that respiratory educators add to a patient's care team in providing optimal COPD care. I'm really hoping that by the end of this evening that all participants that have access to respiratory educators will refer all your COPD patients. But for those of you that don't have direct access, I'll also be sharing some tools and resources that you can use um, in your clinical setting. So, Let's just quickly start with a review of Mary. She's the patient that Dr. Durzo introduced in his um, presentation. She has a diagnosis of COPD confirmed by spirometry, no history of asthma or ATP. Uh, she does have hypertension and a history of uh, an MI five years ago and um, past smoker. When we first met her, she was reporting minimal symptoms, not on treatment. A year later, she presented with increasing shortness of breath involving her regular activities. Her cardiologist had ruled out uh, a cardiac cause of it. She was reporting increased symptom burden and increase in cough, and her treatment was uh, increased to include long-acting bronchodilators. She had never required antibiotics or prednisone for a flare-up. So it's been another year. Um, Mary has now been referred to see me as a respiratory educator. This vignette is uh, meant to give you an idea of what you might expect during an initial visit with a respiratory educator. And as you'll see, much has changed with Mary since the last time we met her. So let's watch uh, this quick vignette. Hi, Mrs. Moore. Welcome to the Lung Health Clinic. Hi, how are you today? My name is Mary. Hi, Mary. Uh, my name is Karen. I'm well today. Thanks for asking. Uh, welcome to the Lung Health Clinic. I'm a respiratory therapist. I work here as a certified respiratory educator. I got a referral from Dr. Durzo. Apparently, you had a recent hospitalization for your COPD. I'd like to know, what are your expectations for today? What's your understanding of the reason why you're here? Well, you're correct. I recently had a hospitalization for a flare-up. 
This was the first time that my COPD had led me to the ER. Um, it was quite the experience to be hospitalized, even though I was very well taken care of. I hope to avoid repeating this in the future. So what I hope is that you can help me to control my COPD, to avoid flare-ups and the hospital. Uh, and maybe answer some questions like, will I need home oxygen for a long time? So you're, you're definitely in the right place. Uh, working as an educator here, I can provide disease education. My goal is to help you develop skills and management strategies. I'm joining into your existing healthcare team to support achieving those goals that you just identified. Over the next hour, we're going to proceed with an initial assessment. We'll book follow-up appointments as required to continue to build on achieving your goals. And how does that sound? It sounds great. So let's start with your recent hospitalization. I want to know a little bit more about what brought you to the emergency room. What symptoms were you experiencing? How were you feeling? And, and how long had you felt that way? Every day I take my inhaled steroids or uh, puffers, um, and I take them on a regular basis. I know when I get very short of breath, I can use my rescue inhaler, my blue inhaler. After I went to see my son, uh, my granddaughter had a cold and it seemed that I guess I caught it. Uh, it felt like there was an, an uh, elephant on my chest. I was very short of breath. I was extremely fatigued. I had problems getting out of bed and I was so tired and getting more and more breathless. I think that I waited too long uh, probably to get to the ER. Sounds like that was a, a very distressing experience. And unfortunately, that does happen all too often. I smiled a bit when you said about catching a, a cold from your granddaughter. Viral infections like that are certainly one of the most common triggers of a flare up like you experienced. So, as we're going into cold and flu season, we'll review your immunization status, making sure you're as well protected as possible. Uh, I also want to uh, know a little bit more about your previous flare ups. How did you manage them? Before this latest flare up, I had always been able to control my symptoms um, using my regular inhalers and my blue uh, rescue inhaler. Uh, I never had to take any other medications for COPD, but this time on top of home oxygen, they've given me antibiotics and steroids. I don't know what to do regarding the flare up and even or even what to do now that it, so that it doesn't happen again. So you've raised a really important point. An action plan is something that I'll be working with you and Dr. Durzo to develop. It's essentially a game plan for you to manage your COPD. What do I do when I'm feeling well? What sorts of things to watch for and realize that I'm starting to experience worse symptoms? And what can I do at this point to start early treatment? The goal is to avoid those emergency room visits in the future and action plans have been proven to help do that. So uh, I also want to review your current list of medications. I see it here and uh, I see that last year you were using nicotine patches. Did you stop smoking at that time? I did. I stopped smoking for about six months and then I started again. Mm -hmm. So let's set some time aside for smoking cessation at this appointment. It certainly seems an appropriate time to do so. Quitting smoking is, it can be very challenging. Nicotine is extremely addictive. It often takes multiple attempts. So we'll set some time aside today to, uh, to delve into that a bit as well. Sounds like a great idea. So I'm looking at your medication list. We'll certainly review that list and your current symptoms and making sure that you're getting the best benefit of your daily inhalers uh, to help manage your symptoms. I'll get you to also demonstrate how you use it. So we're making sure that they're being used effectively. You had a breathing test. My, breath my last breathing test was two or three years ago. I can't remember. Uh, it was a long time ago. Okay. So in our follow-up appointment, we'll make arrangements for an in-office visit where we can get an updated assessment of the condition of your bronchial tubes. We're also going to talk about some of your other medical conditions. I see that you do see a cardiologist. <coughs> Sorry.
sorry. Yes, I do. Um, I'm very concerned about the impact of low oxygen on my heart. When I get short of breath, I can feel my uh, heart pounding out of my chest. And I'm afraid that um, it could cause some heart issues. So your cardiologist is uh, is a part of your big, your, your full healthcare team. Uh, that's a great question you raised because you do have some other conditions that can contribute to symptoms. So we'll be striving to get the best management of your respiratory symptoms. You'll continue to follow up with your cardiologist like you normally would. My full assessment becomes part of your chart, so I share it with Dr. Derzo and all all members of your team have access to to your care notes. Um, all of this is very reassuring and I really appreciate it. Uh, I appreciate that you're willing to work as a team. So when you asked me about your home oxygen, uh, you did say about your concern about its effect on your heart, your requirements for home oxygen will be reassessed in three months and again in nine months and finally in one year. Your requirements may change as you continue to recover for this, from this flare-up. So right now we don't know, but we'll continue to assess that in the future. How have you been feeling in terms of energy and activity since you've been out of the hospital? Um, a little low on energy. Uh, I'm, I'm feeling like I'm dragging myself. Um, and I'm hoping that this gets uh, better over time. So we'll definitely spend some time working on some strategies to get you up and moving more comfortably. So some breathing techniques and strategies that can help minimize symptoms to get you up on your feet. I'm willing to do anything. Excellent. So let's get started with that initial assessment. I do have to say a little bit of artistic license in there. I forgot that we had said Mary was an ex-smoker. So she resumed smoking after having been smoke free for 10 years in our little vignette. But uh, anyway, uh, we'll carry on with Mary's initial assessment. This is essentially a roadmap for the comprehensive management of COPD, going from diagnosis, ideally early, all the way end, uh, to end of life care. And the objective here is to match therapeutic decisions with the clinical status of this patient. I'll be beginning, uh, be beginning tonight's presentation down at that bottom section, looking at spirometry to confirm diagnosis and then tracking lung function impairment, and also spending time on those um, spending time on those objective uh, assessments that Dr. Durzo mentioned. So for COPD assessment, uh, what we're looking at here is an individual performing spirometry. Part of a, a comprehensive clinical assessment will definitely include spirometry. That's an essential part of COPD management. But in addition to the spirometry and the other assessments I just mentioned, a comprehensive assessment must include individual risk factors, the presence of comorbidities uh, that are often associated with COPD. So the next slide demonstrates the Canadian lung health test. Uh, this is an excellent screening tool that can help identify COPD patients in the early stage, allowing optimal treatment and interventions to be initiated at that early stage. Uh, but as Dr. Durzo did point out, unfortunately, many patients won't come to your attention until they have more significant symptoms. They've modified their lifestyle, they minimize their symptoms. I just can't tell you how often I hear people say, yes, I cough, but I smoke, as if that's of no significance. Regardless of whether spirometry, though, is being done as a result of your active screening of patients or because the patient has now presented to your office with symptoms that are suspicious of COPD, Spirometry is a relatively simple test and by all uh, guidelines is required to confirm the diagnosis of COPD. So in other words, we're confirming objectively that presence of fixed and irreversible airways obstruction. It's important to do it when patients are at their baseline, so not still in the recovery stage of an acute illness. A test does have to be done by skilled professionals. Spirometers need to be calibrated regularly. The patient has to be coached effectively in order to ensure that the data that you're receiving is accurate and usable. 
when we do the test, we reference their results as compared to normal values that are predicted for that individual based on their age, sex, height, and ethnicity. And there's two essential measurements. One is the forced vital capacity, the FVC. That's the amount of air that's measured from maximal inhalation, exhaled as fast and forcefully as possible to completely empty. And the FEV1 is the amount of air that's exhaled in the first second of that FVC maneuver. So that's the forced expired volume in one second. To confirm a diagnosis of COPD, the post bronchodilator ratio of FEV1 to FVC has to be below 70% or below the lower limits of normal for that person. An important part of that statement is post-bronchodilator. There may be some partial reversibility of airways obstruction in COPD. So administering a fast-acting bronchodilator during the test and then repeating spirometry after it's reached its peak effect will take the reversible airways obstruction out of that equation and leave you with the presence of fixed and persistent obstruction. So for diagnostic purposes, a bronchodilator should always be included in spirometry. Just a note about bronchodilator response, uh, the amount of reversibility seen in the, in the uh, spirometry report is the percent change in the FEV1 or the FDC. A minimal change of 12% and 200 milliliters of air is the definition of significant bronchodilator response. So again, you may see some partial reversibility with COPD, but if you're seeing what uh, is considered a significant reversibility, then you have to consider the possibility of there being an asthma component in here. So further exploration of this patient, do they have uh, asthma-like symptoms, a, a history of ATP, what's their eosinophil count? Just by way of um, uh, speaking of Mary in her spirometry, she had an insignificant 2% change. I'm also showing the next slide, which shows a much more severe COPD pattern. The green line that you can see is a predicted normal value for that patient. What you're seeing uh, down below is significant slower flow rates, a very prolonged expiratory phase. That gap from that flow volume loop to that green line is representative of airways obstruction. Uh, there was a question in part one about when spirometry should be repeated. Uh, I just want to mention the gold guidelines that recommend annual spirometry. That's both to track lung function uh, decline and identify those that are declining quickly. So I schedule patients as needed for follow-ups, but minimally uh, one year anniversary or one year, one year follow-up, and that would include repeat spirometry um, at least annually. So once we've confirmed the presence of that fixed airways obstruction, the absolute FEV1 value is used to grade the severity. Mild obstruction, or what gold uh, terms grade one, is when the forced expired volume in one second is 80% or greater of what's predicted. Moderate obstruction, gold grade two, the FEV1 is in the 50 to 79% range. Severe grade three, now we're down to 30 to 49%. And finally, very severe obstruction is when the FEV1 is less than 30% of predicted. Now, Mary's FEV1 was 75% when we first met her, so in the moderate range. But since then, she's reported increased symptoms. Now she's had a severe exacerbation. Mary should definitely have repeat spirometry, but we'll do that in follow-up once she's settled down from this recent flare-up. We do know, however, though, that in individuals ability, functional ability or disability is not just dependent on their spirometry numbers. There's often very poor correlation between what the numbers tell us and what a person's capability is or their functional uh, abilities. So next, we're going to move into the other uh, strategies to assess this patient. So two common tools used, uh, we'll look first at the COPD or the CAT test. Dr. Durzo did show this. I want to show this in more detail from an educator's perspective. This asks the patient to consider eight different symptoms and rate the impact on a scale from zero to five. So we're looking at cough, phlegm, chest tightness, dyspnea, limitations in performing their activities at home, their confidence in leaving their home despite the fact they have a lung condition, how their COPD affects their sleep and their overall energy levels, 
And when we tally all those numbers, uh, we get a total that gives us an indication of the symptom burden for that individual, uh, going from low, medium, high, and then finally very high impact. When you're using the CAT tool, it also gives you some uh, possible, uh, some prompting for some possible management considerations. So for those of you that are prescribing medications based on symptom burden, this is a, a great tool to help you select optimal treatment. But for me as an educator, I want to go back and look at each of these individual scores, the ones having the greatest impact on their quality of life. And this can help me set goals with that patient. Uh, it helps direct my focus on what interactions we'll do. Uh, I'm remembering Mary's CAT score. She went from eight, which was low impact initially. She went up to 12, medium impact a year later. What would her scores be like today? What interventions, teachings, uh, skill building can we do to help improve her symptoms? And I'll expand on some of that a little bit later. I do also want to say that sleep question in here almost always leads to another conversation. Uh, it typically goes something like, I don't sleep well, but I don't think it's my COPD. I have to sleep sitting up. I snore so loudly, I wake myself up. I worry so much that I can't fall asleep at night and then I, I just can't shut my mind off all night long. So here we may be identifying some comorbidities for that patient. Another tool to assess the symptom burden, the modified MRC dyspnea scale classifies level of breathlessness from zero to four. I just want to point out here too that there is an MRC dyspnea scale, same description, but its numbers go from one to five. It was used by CTS until their 2019 update, and it was switched with the CTS to use the MMRC dyspnea scale. So just a note if you're comparing previous values for someone to make sure that you're aware of which scale was used uh, during that assessment. So here we're grading a patient's breathlessness from mild all the way up to very severe and disabling at the other end. This is a really quick and easy tool, and it does provide more details of the dyspnea that a patient is experiencing compared to the CAT scale, but it limits it to just dyspnea. And again, other comorbidities can contribute to breathlessness that also have to be considered. Remember, Mary went from grade one to grade two, and her cardiologist had ruled out a cardiac cause of those increased symptoms. The next assessment, completing uh, this patient's assessment, we're going to look at their exacerbation history. This slide shows the CTS definition of a, a flare-up or a lung attack. Uh, it's essentially an acute event with worsening of symptoms beyond their normal day-to-day -day variability, so relative to their baseline dyspnea, cough, and phlegm. Uh, it may warrant additional medications such as antibiotic or corticosteroids, and it may require healthcare services. First of all, the patient needs to understand what a flare up is. It's not uncommon for patients to be confirmed or be, or be diagnosed with COPD after their first visit to urgent care or the emergency department. But have they had prior less severe episodes that weren't recognized as a COPD flare up? Uh, a cold with symptoms that persisted for weeks and they just continued to use their long acting bronchodilator. These events may never have been reported to their primary care practitioner because the patient didn't recognize them as a flare up of COPD. I'm wondering if Mary shared her previous flare ups uh, that she had been managing at home. So once we've defined what we mean, we further classify them as mild, moderate, or severe, mild being worsening symptoms without a change in prescribed medication. So that would be increasing their bronchodilator use, a moderate flare-up requiring antibiotics and or corticosteroids, and a severe flare-up meaning that they've had to go to the emergency department or required a hospital admission. And those severe exacerbations may also be associated with uh, acute respiratory failure. And finally, to complete their exacerbation assessment, we look at their risk of future exacerbations using the best predictor that we have, and that is their prior history. So low risk is having one or fewer moderate exacerbations in the last year. So in other words, corticosteroids or antibiotics, but not requiring uh, hospital services. 
High risk is having two or more of those moderate flare ups or one or more of a severe exacerbation in the past year. So this a CTS tool was thoroughly discussed by Dr. Derzo. I'll quickly show it again tonight where we're tying in the results of our assessment, their symptom burden, their exacerbation risk. And we're, using, uh, we're receiving clinical recommendations of where to start with pharmacotherapy. Moving from left to right, we're seeing worsening lung function, increasing symptoms, and we're dividing it into whether they're at low or high risk of flare-ups. Uh, solid arrows indicate step-up therapy. Dashed arrows indicate potential step-down of therapy. Uh, Dr. Durso spoke quite a bit about the role of ICS, inhaled corticosteroids, in COPD patients. And it was kind of funny because Mary, unscripted, said that she takes a steroid inhaler as well as her daily puffers. Uh, now she has no history of asthma, so I'd certainly want to know more about why she was prescribed that medication. And I'll mention spirometry here again, in addition to reassessment of symptoms and flare-ups after there's been any uh, medication change, whether you're stepping up or stepping down, repeating spirometry is appropriate to objectively uh, assess the effects of those medication changes. I'm including the GOLD tool, which uh, is very similar. So anybody that uses the GOLD classification, and we do include this in our reports, it's the same objective measurements uh, using the MMRC or the CAT scores, their exacerbation history. Uh, the GOLD divides it into groups A, B, C, or D. Groups A and B are those at low risk of exacerbations where group A has fewer symptoms compared to group B. And group C and D are at high risk of exacerbations where group C has milder symptoms compared to group D. Whichever cho uh, tool you choose, uh, I'm putting them up side by side for you to compare, but you can see that it's using the same strategies to um, arrive at the same pharmacotherapy recommendations. Again, this is time to question, uh, are Mary's current inhalers optimally matching her requirements, particularly following this last flare-up? So now you've been given these recommendations, uh, LAMA, LABA, LAMA, LABA, ICS, combinations. Uh, so it's a little bit of uh, code cracking here to figure out where to go next. And this is where I wanna share this really useful Lung Health Foundation tool for medications. It's available online. It's a beautiful thing. It separates uh, all hail inhalers, so not just for COPD, but all available inhalers grouped into classifications. It's continually being updated, so it's, it's up to date. It includes uh, dosing, age approval, coverage. Um, so you, you can just get all information. This is a two-point slide. There's, there's quite a few inhalers to choose from. But still, when you're in this classification, you have to decide which medication to use in each class. And there's a number of considerations. Dr. Durzo named many of them. It can include patient preference, the ease of use, their requirements to learn more than one device. Uh, are there advantages for once a day versus twice a day dosing? What's the coverage like for the out-of-pocket costs? Placebo demonstrators are available for most, if not all, inhalers. Uh, I have an assortment of them. I like to show patients this is what this is, this is how this works, and ask them, do you think you have a preference? Uh, and I also want to highlight our pharmacy team members at this point that I often pick their brains, uh, particularly when I'm looking for cost-effective op options for patients with no uh, medication coverage. Another great lung, associ lung Health Foundation uh, link is how to use an inhaler. Um, for demonstration of inhaler techniques that would be useful both for the providers and the patients, one thing that cannot be overstated here is the, uh, the need for initial teaching and then regular reassessment. So I want to share a quick story of a gentleman who saw me for an initial appointment. He came in pretty angry. He had wasted more than $20 on this blue puffer. His doctor said it would help his breathing. It's no darn good. And frankly, he wasn't that polite as he was saying this. So I asked him when, why, and how he uses that inhaler. And he told me that when he feels short of air, he took the cap off, gave it a few shakes, two squirts up each nostril, three or four rapid fire squirts under his tongue. 
Uh, that's a true story, but funny enough, he knew to shake that inhaler. But imagine another patient with long-standing COPD, been using the same medication for many years. You might assume there's no need to reassess uh, inhaler technique after all this time. But what may have changed with that patient? Have they developed some arthritis in their hands? Have they suffered cognitive impairments such that they can't use their inhalers anymore? Has their disease progressed to the point that they can no longer use that particular inhaler? So it, it's definitely uh, something that needs to be initially taught, but then reassessed. We do this at every visit, uh, both their technique and their adherence. Has there been an increase in symptoms or exacerbation that prompts you to, to look at those uh, factors? both their technique and their adherence with their inhalers. Uh, and again, I want to mention our pharmacy team, team members here. They're uh, an excellent partner for teaching and, uh, and reviewing inhalers when they're dispensed. I'll also be giving a few links uh, for other inhaler techniques at the end of the presentation. So we've confirmed diagnosis, we've assessed the patients, we've started optimal pharmacotherapy. Let's turn our attention to exacerbations. We've defined them, we've assessed this patient's history and risk, but why should we be so concerned? And here's what we know about them. They do reduce health-related quality of life in individuals. They lead to increased dyspnea, exercise, uh, reduced exercise capacity. Think back to how Mary felt after her flare-up. We know that they accelerate decline in lung function, so we can see that in repeat spirometry. They're associated with increased mortality, and they're also a heavy cost and utilization burden for the healthcare system. Let's take a closer look at those impacts. Start with the patient. Exacerbations, as Dr. Durzo said, are trajectory changing events, definitely not in a positive direction. This slide demonstrates the progressive step-like negative progression of a patient's functional ability. COPD is a progressive disease and flare-ups impact that progression. Recovery from exacerbations may take weeks to even months. Uh, in the GOLD 2020 update, it's uh, said that 20% of patients report that they had not recovered to their pre-exacerbation state after eight weeks, and often they don't return to their previous baseline. So prevention of exacerbations whenever possible has the potential to modify disease trajectory. When we're looking at healthcare impact, let's start with primary care. A flare-up may prompt an urgent unscheduled office visit and does require close follow-up. In terms of healthcare utilization, it's the most frequent cause of acute hospitalizations in adults, the highest total cost of care. And putting that into some perspective, um, the most recent statistics I could find was 2017 in Ontario, where we had more than 80,000 emergency room visits, more than 27,000 hospitalization admissions for COPD, and that translates to $250 million every year. So we do have a need to act here. Reducing the occurrence and severity of flare-ups is essential and doable. So let's look at what causes them. Two thirds of flare ups are due to either an upper respiratory tract infection or exposure to air pollution. So that's important. Number one and two, viral infections, air pollution. So that speaks to some seasonal variation in flare up risks. Uh, when are we most likely to be exposed to viral infections? Right now we're in cold and flu season. When are we most likely to be exposed to air pollution? More likely in the summer. So now is certainly a time to recommend flu shots. Uh, I've included a picture of the air quality health index on this slide. Dr. Durzo did mention it, but I find this a really useful tool, uh, particularly in the summer where the air pollution has that potential to be high. Um, it's reported on many weather networks. You can get it online. I have an app on my phone. Just out of interest, the AQHI here in rural southwestern Ontario tonight is four. So we look at that as a moderate risk. For the general population, no need to modify your usual outdoor activities unless you're experiencing symptoms. But if you're in that risk population having respiratory or cardiovascular disease, at that range, you should consider reducing or rescheduling strenuous outdoor activities, especially if you're already experiencing symptoms. That can be enough to put you over to the edge into a flare-up. 
As the number goes higher, the recommendations to reduce or reschedule activities uh, increases. And uh, just as a note, our son lives in Kelowna. They were many days in the 10 plus range where even the general population should reschedule strenuous activities. And that was, of course, due to the uh, wildfires that they had there this summer. Excuse me, one third of the cases, uh, the cause is unknown, but there are a number of potential triggers. They should all be explored. When you encourage people to reflect on their flare ups, sometimes they can recognize triggers and possibly avoid them, avoiding, uh, avoid those triggers to avoid future flare ups. Uh, examples in mix exposure to uh, indoor or outdoor allergens or irritants, weather changes, stress, heart failure. Uh, remember from the vignette, Ms. Moore caught a uh, cold from her grandson, but I wonder if she can recognize some factors that contributed to her previous milder flare-ups. And again, uh, Dr. Durzo did share this slide. It's uh, the CTS document from 2014, outlining interventions that are recommended, suggested, and those that are not suggested uh, for the prevention of exacerbations. This includes inhaled therapies, oral um, uh, therapies, and then non-pharmacological therapies. As an educator, these are always in my mind. What more could benefit this patient? And Dr. Durzo went over the medications quite thoroughly in his report. I want to just mention a couple of the non-pharmacological uh, therapy options. We see pulmonary rehab in there recommended for individuals within four weeks of a flare-up. But honestly, formal pulmonary rehab in Canada, the last I heard was available for 2% of patients and not available at all during COVID restrictions. So with my patients, I promote and encourage regular physical activity to prevent deconditioning. When indicated, I teach, practice, demonstrate breathing techniques with their patients. What are the barriers to their activity and can we mitigate these? And so when we're doing those um, breathing techniques with patients, I, I look at other factors. Are they hypoxemic? So when I'm walking with them and we're practicing those breathing techniques, there's an oximeter on their finger to see if they're desaturating. Do they need mobility aids to help them walk safely? One of the um, recommendations that you'll see on this slide is uh, an action plan. Action plans with education and case management. What are they? They're tools to help an individual manage exacerbations, use uh, color formats, colored zones, just like a traffic indicator, um, and they mean the same thing. Green means keep going. Symptoms are uh, at your baseline. Take your usual medications. If you're on oxygen, it's, it's prescription. Keep going, but monitoring your what's your baseline, sputum, cough, shortness of breath when you're feeling your best. Yellow zone means caution. Symptoms are increasing and it's time to take action. The red zone indicates the need for emergency medical treatment. So the goal of having an action plan is to guide patients to, first of all, recognize a flare-up early, start applying appropriate intervention in that yellow zone early. It's developed in partnership between the patient, the primary care provider, the educator. We share it with all relevant partners. And that plan is reviewed and revised as needed. We give them a written copy to have at home for reference. This is probably a, a good a time as any to talk about home oxygen. Um, just kind of quickly when you should consider oxygen for a patient. It is uh, known to be potentially life prolonging in patients with stable COPD that uh, are severely hypoxemic at rest. So those are individuals in an arterial blood gas where you see the PaO2 less than or equal to 55, uh, the SAT less than or equal to 88% if a blood gas cannot be done. Uh, for individuals with a history of right heart failure or persistent erythrocytosis, if they're in the PaO2 50 to 60 range, they also qualify for long-term oxygen therapy. Uh, but you can also qualify if there's evidence of exertional or nocturnal hypoxemia. So oxygen therapy reduces mortality in patients with hypoxemic at rest. So definitely consider uh, sending them for a home oxygen assessment. Consider it in patients that are reporting severe dyspnea despite optimal therapies. 
When we're considering it for exertional dyspnea, though, we both have to prove this severe breathlessness, but also that individual's motivation to improve their daily activity using oxygen therapy. Uh, as we said in Mary's vignette, that need may be short term. So once she's fully recovered from this flare up, her oxygen requirements may change. Once oxygen is initiated, now this is true for Ontario, I, I'm, I'm certain that other provinces uh, could have different criteria, but in oxygen from the date of initiation, that requirement is reassessed at three months nine months and then finally one year after initiation if you still qualify it's for life and the uh, there's many providers certainly in our community they're all excellent they provide all the service and reassessment at regular intervals so just to kind of summarize uh, the goals of care mary's goals were to reduce symptoms manage her flare-ups she didn't want to ever go back to the emergency room she wanted to improve her exercise tolerance her daily activity and that translates to improved health status uh, she did want support for smoking cessation she wanted someone to answer her questions she wanted to make sure she's got good communication with her providers my goals is to help mary achieve those goals by working collaboratively with her healthcare team providing education, supporting the development of skills and strategies that she can use to promote self-management of her COPD. I'm trying to reduce the impact of COPD both for Mary and the healthcare system. So if we summarize everything that we've spoken about, let's pull it all together to follow best practice guidelines for the care of your COPD patients. This slide summarizes really what optimal care looks like and what you'd be expected to provide for your patients. And often that can be limited to a seven to 10 minute encounter with the patients when you have them in your office. So all that it involved to confirming that diagnosis assessing and reassessing uh, their, their symptoms, their inhalers, consideration for additional therapies, teaching, action plan, uh, focusing on future, uh, avoiding future flare-ups, supporting smoking cessation, regular follow-up. This uh, slide, this study published by the Nature Journal in 2019, involves high-risk COPD patients in primary care, and it concluded that patients that receive case management, self-management education, and skills training with structured follow-up by the physician and respiratory educator, as compared to the usual physician care alone, demonstrated substantially improved quality of life knowledge, FEV1, reduced their severe exacerbations, and uh, their healthcare utilization. I really want to emphasize that a referral to a respiratory educator is more than disease education. This is not a drill them and fill them approach to everything you may need or not need to know about COPD. Disease education is part of it, but it's much more. It's case management providing individualized uh, care in a collaborative goal to promote their health and wellness. And it's certainly appropriate to refer all your patients with COPD to a, a COPD educator. So what can you expect as a provider? An effective and cost-efficient collaborative approach to provide your patients with optimal and individualized COPD case management. One of the best parts is minimal time requirements on your part. We typically need five minutes of your time at the end of our assessments to meet with you and come up with a plan of care. What the uh, oh, just and, and just I guess to further um, uh, speak about the role of the respiratory educator is to make recommendations to you as indicated. So for further tests or uh, further assessments, um, using our other healthcare partners, when it is a dietitian, an occupational therapist, or a physiotherapist, be beneficial to this patient. Referral to my colleagues that do heart failure education mental health referrals, res respirology referrals, asthma assessments, HOMO2. So we will always share with you uh, recommendations as they, uh, as they come up. What the patients can expect, collaborative case management, using best practices, assessing their individual needs and goals throughout their whole course with the disease. And that just lists, again, all the best practice things that we review with them, individual to them. 
uh, going forward. We do advanced care planning, palliative care, uh, not to be confused with end of life care. Additional considerations, safe travel, coping, sleep. So uh, full comprehensive care individualized. So for those of you who are thinking, great, but I don't have access to a CRE, what tools are available for you and where can you access them? Uh, starting with the link to the Canadian Thoracic Society guidelines library uh, and their knowledge translation tools. In that section is where you can access their uh, action plan. It conveniently in, uh, includes recommendations for selection of antibiotics for a flare up and prednisone dosing. Uh, lots of other tools available in that knowledge translation, including a spirometry interpretation. There's lots of helpful tools in there. Again, I've put up the uh, COPD assessment test link. We'll um, link to Health Quality Ontario's COPD quality standards statement. And finally, the Lung Health Foundation that is full of helpful links for you. Uh, they, they have a lung health line, either by phone or by computer, that an individual can speak with a certified respiratory educator, so providing education, information, uh, information, consistent interaction about their diagnosis. These are tailored for the individual patient, uh, according to the healthcare provider's site and the patient's need. Uh, support groups for people living with or uh, for people that are caring for someone living with lung disease. And online focused video, this is a great tool for um, continuing to exercise at home for those that have completed pulmonary rehab or just those that want to stay active uh, in their home environment. This circle of care booklet, uh, I call it the Coles Notes of everything about COPD. It's developed with all the relevant partners at the table, so Lung Health, uh, the CNRC, that's the organization that sets certification standards for CREs, the Family Physician Airway Group, Canadian Pharmacists, the CTS. It was produced um, with an education grant supported in part by AstraZeneca, and it's through my uh, AstraZeneca rep that I get copies of it. It is available online. I've put just a few of the select pages up, but it includes information, pictures, and text about everything involving COPD care. So all the inhalers, a great section with pictures of how to use them. You can uh, write specific information in that section. Uh, speaking specifically tonight, how to recognize a flare up. There's a section um, uh, involving a, uh, an action plan where you can speak about the actions that should be taken in those yellow and red zones. Uh, and I would encourage anyone that wants to know more about us, uh, the Asthma Research Group Incorporated, and our best care um, programs in primary care, you can check out our website as well. This um, final slide refers to all the references that are uh, quoted in tonight's presentation. And at this point, thank you for your attention, and we'll uh, open it to questions. Perfect. So I'll invite Dr. Durzo to uh, ask the question. Yeah, thanks, Lisa. Um, so Lisa, thank you so much for, for an excellent talk. I, <clears throat> you know, one of the things I find <coughs> when, when I was working um, in the respiratory departments of various hospitals was that um, the, the CREs, uh, and, and in the days before there were CREs, um, the um, the respiratory um, um, technicians, they were sort of the people who did all the behind the scenes care that was probably the glue of the patient's sort of uh, well-being. Uh, but, um, you know, when you get to clinic, oftentimes there just isn't enough time as a physician to, um, to be able to be as comprehensive. So I think uh, for those uh, uh, colleagues who are attending tonight, um, you know, uh, pa patients like Mary, we, we all have them, um, and, and many of them, unfortunately, they, they suffer in silence because um, they often feel that we don't have the time um, to address some of the challenges that they're facing, and sometimes we don't feel that we have the time to ask some of those questions that we might think about, but we just don't want to open that door. Um, 
and I think you know uh, Kara has done a wonderful job in highlighting um, the you know how comprehensive COPD care really is um, when you when you're really trying to individualize and tailor therapy to that unique uh, person. Uh, one of the questions, Karen, was um, that you had mentioned uh, repeating spirometry. When would you recommend uh, full PFTs versus simple spirometry? I, I was hoping that question would come up. So um, a full, payment, full, full pulmonary function tests include measurements of lung volumes that cannot be measured directly. Uh, most often that's done through body plethysmography and it assesses the diffusion capacity of the lungs. Full uh, PFTs are definitely um, indicated if you're seeing a restrictive process in spirometry. So that's a vital capacity that's lower than anticipated, a restrictive component. That may be in a COPD individual related to air trapping, so with an increased residual volume. Sometimes it's just related to body habitus, uh, where weight is held uh, around the belly limiting lung expansion. It uh, is also seen in interstitial lung diseases. So anytime that you see a low RV, or, or, uh, excuse me, FR, FVC, it's an indication to send for uh, pulmonary function tests. Also, if there's a question about oxygenation, that diffusion capacity looks at how well oxygen is able to diffuse uh, through lung tissue. So identifying oxygenation issues. You know, Karen, one of, one of the other things I find helpful sometimes is um, sometimes the um, um, simple spirometry doesn't tell you. They, they may appear to have the same FAV1, but they're feeling more short of breath than usual. And sometimes um, doing full PFTs uh, has helped me understand whether they're trapping more air than normal. Yes. Uh, and so that, that, you know, thanks for raising that, that, that point. Uh, Karen, another question is, are you able to adjust pharmacotherapy using a medical directive or are, you, are your prescribers readily available? Uh, so, no, I, I don't have any medical directives to, uh, to change pharmacotherapy. They, they are readily available for the most part. Um, and if they're not, we communicate through our, uh, our EMR system to send messages. Um, I try to do a face-to-face -face discussion whenever possible. If you've got a couple of minutes, it might have to wait until the end of the day to catch the providers, uh, but we communicate directly. Okay. Uh, thanks for, for an anonymous comment that says, uh, Dr. Derza, we are respiratory therapists. Uh, respiratory technicians are not members of a regulatory body, nor do normally they interact with patients. Um, Thanks for caring enough to change. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, you know, Karen, you, 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 you talked about um, the Air Quality Health Index, and, and um, I, um, I can't emphasize how relevant that is, uh, although um, I'm sure many on the call, and over time, we can find reasons to minimize it. But I'll never forget a patient of mine who uh, had... Um, um, a, a severe COPD um, and who called me and told me that uh, he, he also had prostate cancer and told me that he was worried about going to his uh, urologist uh, because uh, the weatherman said the weather was bad. And so I looked up uh, and, and found out that the air quality index, a health index would be uh, uh, above uh, close to seven. So mm -hmm. I said to him, uh, I said to him, why don't you just wait? Um, and, and, and I said, you know, you really should wait because he had, he had heart issues. He had uh, pulmonary issues. So unfortunately, he didn't take my advice. And he yeah. comes to the clinic um, and was in terrible shape by the time he got to the clinic. Um, but he got a shot. And, um, and then he, he goes home um, and called me. And he said, you know, you couldn't have been more right. He says, I barely made it home. He peed himself mm. uh, because he was so short of breath. Um, and it, it sort of reminded me how important that is. And, and there, have, there have actually been studies to show when you have these spikes in poor air quality, they tend to often coincide 
with emergency room activity with respects to asthmatics and, and patients with COPD. So I, I thought that was a, a really important point. Um, it, Karen, from your experience, what do you think, what are the most common um, issues that you find uh, patients bring to you? Uh, I, I would like to speak uh, a little bit about going back to when I was hospital based. So uh, um, my COPD role was to seek out inpatients and start a dialogue with them, start the process of COPD management, and then ensure that on discharge, they were referred to a lung health clinic. Uh, those that were not linked to a health team or a, a primary care provider that had access to a respiratory educator were followed in, in our hospital-based COPD clinic. Uh, overwhelmingly, I found people admitted to hospital, like Mary said, I waited too long. I, I knew I was getting worse, but I kept hoping that I would get better and they wait and wait and wait. And certainly the longer you, they wait, the sicker they are. Um, that again, just speaks to, uh, action plans. I, during COVID, I heard from many patients, there's no way they would go to the emergency room. They, they'll stay at home until they just can't stay there anymore. So yeah. the, the important need of having action plans, some in when appropriate to have some standby orders for prednisone and antibiotics so the patients can initiate therapy uh, early. And that was definitely one thing is waiting too long. They know that they're not doing well, but they just keep thinking it's going to get better. Yeah, and that was Mary's uh, assessment as well, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, here's, a, here's a really good question. When would you consider stopping routine spirometry? For example, in elderly patients, end stage, very severe COPD, uh, patients who are on optimized treatment or on home O2, is, is there any time when you would consider not doing spirometry? No, there, there is, when it's not going to help guide treatment anymore certainly at that end stage there's nothing to be to be learned from spirometry right. at that point yeah um now let me just have a look um here's a comment that i'd like to share thank you karen for your presentation i appreciated the information you provided on what total copd care looks like there's much work to be done um and there was another comment that i thought was, uh, uh, thanks, Karen. Great review. Love how your patients surprised you as they always surprise us. Um, and um, uh, I think we are very close to the end. Um, and I don't see any other questions. Uh, Karen, do you have any comments that you think you would like to share before we, we call it a night? And there is one more point that I, I didn't make when I was speaking about home oxygen, and that is the misperception by many patients that their breathlessness would be helped with oxygen. So we have criteria to give evidence that it may be beneficial, and that is objectively confirming hypoxemia. Um, it's funny because I live just outside of Windsor and many, many of our patients access healthcare in the United States or they'll purchase items when they're in the United States. So they'll buy their own concentrator and they'll buy their own portable concentrator because they don't qualify for oxygen okay. in Canada, in Ontario. Uh, but that misperception that it's going to make it better, oftentimes it has nothing. Breathlessness isn't anything to do with low oxygen levels. It's those other strategies that we can optimize, making sure that they're on optimal pharmacotherapy, using strategies to minimize breathless pacing, breathing strategies uh, to reduce their breathlessness. But yeah, just a really common misperception, and I was quite surprised moving down here recently how many people just go buy it from the united states <laughs> you know what thanks Karen. I, I, I'm, we're getting a last minute questions here i've got two of them if we can go through them quickly one is where can we get more information about patients who are becoming more palliative or end of life mm. so uh, it, it, uh, I would recommend reaching out to your palliative care network. Uh, so I'm new to this region. Uh, I was very familiar with the palliative network in Simcoe County, but when I moved down here, there was an individual that 
I felt should be linked with palliative care. I don't know if he's going to die in the next year. And that's that indication to when should you consider initiating palliative care uh, was what was introduced to me in Simcoe County is if I'm asking myself, would I be surprised if this patient dies within the next year? And if my answer is no, then it's time to initiate palliative care. So I had to do some digging down here uh, in Windsor, uh, phoning the palliative network, speaking finally to an intake nurse who advised me that, yeah, absolutely, the patient can self-refer uh, and anyone can refer to palliative care to get them into the intake to do an assessment so that as their needs change, they're already uh, involved and ready to, to move forward with end of life care as we're getting down that way. Okay. Uh, Jenna, I'm just going to sneak in one final question. And that is when, when you uh, repeat spirometry for assessing response to therapy, do you still, do you still ask patients to stop certain inhalers or is that only recommended for initial diagnostic purposes? Yeah, I, I, we don't stop them afterwards because I want to see what the spirometry is like while they're on there using their inhalers. Uh, so stopped for initial diagnosis, um, not necessarily. Sometimes uh, you don't need to stop medications. We're assessing, uh, it depends on where they are, um, being used for diagnostic purposes, though, should be off inhalers. But once we've confirmed a diagnosis, we just tell them to continue their inhalers as prescribed, holding their short-acting bronchodilator for four hours if possible. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Karen, again. And um, I'm sure that uh, folks, uh, based on the questions, uh, uh, really enjoyed it. Thank you Over very you. much. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Over to you, Jen. Much. Yes, I can agree. Based on what I saw in the chat, um, everyone has been very um, appreciative, Karen, of what you provided here this evening. So thank you so much. And Dr. DeRuzzo, to you as well for moderating. Um, you both did such a great job. So on, the, on behalf of the Lung Health Foundation, I would like to thank you both um, for being here this evening. And Lisa and Julia from a Unique Advance as well, who are supporting us on the technical side of things. So I, at this point, I would encourage everyone who's attending this evening to take time Time to complete the session evaluation. So a link will be emailed, or you can use the QR code that you see on the screen. Um, but please do send us your feedback. We very much uh, look forward to hearing from you about that. Um, I do also look forward to seeing everyone again on November 9th, when Dr. Chris Lishka will present the third and final installment of the COPD case series. So thanks, everyone, for attending, and have a great rest of your evening. And take care. Thanks, everyone. Good night, everybody. Good night.